Last Sunday, we continued with the sermon series on the kingdom of God in a word entitled Kingdom Mathematics. Turning to Jesus' miracle of feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, we sought to describe what happens when God multiplies. Our main point was that when we place the little that we have in the master's hand, God blesses it to become much. Little becomes much, the songwriter said, when you place it in the master's hand. The little becomes so much, in fact, that all the hungry are filled. Indeed, when God has finished multiplying, there are leftover fragments, and leftovers, we learn, have value. Today, I would have us consider when God does addition. Addition, along with multiplication, subtraction, and division, is one of the four basic operations of arithmetic. Addition is a process or skill of calculating the total of two or more numbers or amounts. The addition of two whole numbers is the total amount of those quantities combined. Performing addition is one of the simplest numerical tasks. In fact, addition of very small numbers is accessible to even toddlers. The most basic task, one plus one, can be performed by infants as young as five months and even some non-human animals. Everybody here, I believe, knows how to do arithmetic. We're not going to quiz you, but if you know the answers, I want you to tell me really quickly, one plus one equals two plus two equals three plus three, four plus four, five plus five. Okay, so we all paid attention in math class. <laughs> you have to learn how to add. If you don't get addition, forget geometry, trigonometry, calculus, complex sequences. You have to know how to. You have to know how to add. In fact, if you ever go to the, I grew up in the city, and we have what we call in the city corner stores. And so when you were very little, you had to make sure that you knew how to get your, calculate your change. So if I went and I got a pack of now and in a sneaker bar and so on and so on and so on, I needed to make sure that Mrs. Crowder, if she, had, if she was on an off day, that I was on a good day and I, I could still get my change. <laughs> God bless Mrs. Crowder. Because addition is so foundational to the enterprise of mathematics and life, it should not surprise us that we find addition in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. In the first verses of the first book of the Bible, we learn that God does addition. Creation, in fact, begins with addition. Life begins when God adds. From zero. That is, from a great expanse of nothingness, God adds seas and mountains, the sky and the stars, planets, plants, animals. God just keeps adding and adding and adding and adding. God even created a numerical sequence of six days on which to do addition. And on the seventh day, the Bible says, God rested. So many times in life we feel like we're stuck with a zero. But I want you to know today that God still does addition. I believe there's a reason that God is adding in the first verses of the first book of 66 books that we call the Bible. God never wants us to forget that God is in the business of addition. And it's very important because a lot of times we feel like we're we feel like we're in some kind of minus game. Yes? Have you ever been there before? Where you just didn't have enough, or you didn't feel like you, you were worth enough, and you didn't feel like you had the resources that that you needed in order to fulfill the job. But God still does addition. If you believe it, say amen. amen. I'm a living witness that nobody does addition like God does addition. God can add in the material realm, as in food and clothing and shelter. But God also adds in abstract quantities as well. In other words, if you need peace in your equation, God can add it. If you need joy in your life, see some of these things are kind of hard, kind of hard to quantify. 
I mean, how much joy do you have right now? Can you give me a number for that, anybody? Some of these things are hard to quantify, but we need them in order to live. I know, I need, anybody need joy to live? Anybody need peace to live? Anybody need a sound mind to live? And see, the thing is, God adds in those dimensions in our, of, of our lives, and there really is no price tag for the ways that God, that God adds in those ways. If you need God to do some addition in your life, I'm here to tell you today that God can do it. God's Son, Jesus Christ, gives us a formula for God's addition in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Listen at what Jesus said. But seek first. Do you hear the math? The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. But seek first. In other words, as a first priority in life, seek God. And if we seek God first, God's promise to us is that all of the other things that we, that we lay awake at night worrying about, God will take care of them. Notice that the formula for God's addition in our lives excludes the one thing that we are so inclined to do, which is worry. We worry so often about material things, about the food and the clothing and the shelter and the tuition that God promises to provide. If we want to experience God's addition in our lives, however, we have to refuse to work. What does it mean to work? I believe that we all know what it means to worry because we have all worried about one thing or another. To worry is to give way to anxiety or unease, to allow one's mind to dwell on difficulty or troubles. Worry is mental distress or agitation resulting from concern, usually for something impending or anticipated. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6 that we should not worry. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, Jesus said, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not, are you not of more value than they? So Jesus says, don't worry. I take care of the birds of the air. I take care of the lilies of the field. You are of more value than many sparrows. So don't worry. I like the way that the songwriter talks about not worrying. About the futility of worrying when he wrote these words. Why should I feel discouraged, he said. Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Our Lord Jesus ends his discourse on worrying by asking, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? The English Standard Version of the same passage says, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? The suggestion is that worrying will not lead to addition. Instead, worry will inevitably lead to subtraction in one form or another. Studies on the negative effects of worrying are well documented. Recent studies conclude that worrying can affect the body in ways that may surprise you. When worrying becomes excessive, Excessive, it can lead to feelings of high anxiety and even cause you to be physically ill. There is truth to the phrases worried sick and worried to death. The problem occurs when fight or flight is triggered daily by excessive worry and anxiety. I want you to listen to me very carefully. The fight or flight response causes the body's sympathetic nervous system to release stress hormones such as cortisol. These hormones can move blood sugar levels, and triglycerides that can be used by the body for fuel. When the excessive fuel in the body isn't used for physical activities, the chronic anxiety and outpouring of stress hormones can have serious physical consequences. Now, in other words, when you're stressed out, there's something building up. I mean, can I put it in layman terms? When you're stressed out like that, your body is producing uh, hormones that, that if you don't use them, will have negative consequences for your body. Are you listening to me? Yes. So you're stressed out, and, and you're not even going to the gym. 
Somebody's gonna get this one. You're stressed out and you're not doing and that you know it's all it's all just it's just working and it's working in your body. You're not it's working in your body and it's having a negative consequence on you. And, and here's some of the here's some of the negative consequences. Suppression of the immune system, digestive disorders, muscle tension, short-term memory loss, treatment, premature coronary artery disease, and heart attack. All of this happens if we if we worry. Now this is this is very serious. There's a reason that Jesus tells us don't worry. It, it goes beyond the spiritual dimension of not worrying to include even your own health, even your own life. Worrying inevitably leads to subtraction. But God wills to do addition in our lives. Yes, worrying undermines God's formula for addition. Why? Because worrying is a manifestation of fear. Fear has no place in the formula for God's addition. The Bible says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. In other words, fear, fear is not one of the variables in God's equation for your life. It has no place. There's no place for fear in your life. Are, are you understood? Because God does not give that to us. God is not giving fear to us as one of the as one of the variables that we should be using in the equation of life. He gives us power, God gives us love, and God gives us a sound mind. That's everything that we need for addition. Yes? So what we have to do now, and this word is just not for you today, this word is also for me, is that we have to stop worrying. We just gotta we, we gotta and so so you said, well, well how do you how do you do that? How do you stop worrying? I mean, I've been worrying for, some of us have been worrying our whole lives. How do, you just, how do you shut it off? How do you stop worrying about the bills, the tuition, and the car, and this, and that, and this, and that? You know, one, one of the ways I think that we can do it, and this is, this is really good for me, when we begin to start worrying, you know what we should start doing? We should start praying. As soon as we're flooded with, with worry, you know, there's it, it no problem when we, when we begin to worry to just utter a prayer, yes? Because we have to have something to combat the worry that, that seeks to overwhelm us every single day of our lives, yes? Worry, if, if you're going to worry about something today, and guess what, tomorrow's going to come, and you're going to worry about probably the same thing on tomorrow, yes? Now, here's the thing about worry. Oftentimes, we worry about things that never happen. <laughs> We worry and ruminate and ruminate and ruminate. God has already fixed the thing that you're worrying about, and so you wait for two weeks worrying about what God fixed, what God fixed before the world began. Don't worry. God cares for you. And God does not want you, God does not want me to live in a perpetual state of worry. Now there's another reason that worry is, in, in some sense, God is just not saying don't worry just because, but I think when we worry, we actually, worry is a manifestation of our doubt. Mm. Worrying says we don't believe God, you can fix it. Worrying says that God, I don't think you can get me out of this one. Worry says that God, you know, the disciples were worried. After Jesus was crucified, the disciples who had watched Jesus do all these wonderful miracles for three years, had learned all of his teachings on the kingdom of God. They saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. They saw Jesus uh, 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 raise the widows from Nain's son from the dead. They saw Jesus do miracle after miracle after miracle. And after Jesus was crucified, they locked themselves in the room and they worried. They were so afraid they did not even want to go outside. Why should we work? Jesus shows up in the midst of their worry and he breathes on them and he gives them what, we need, what he already had given them, power, yes? He said, receive the Holy Spirit. God gives us power, yes? And I believe that, that you have enough power and I believe that we have enough power to combat the worry that comes to us every single day. We have the power. We've got the power. And what you've got to do, what we've got to do is we've got to substitute another discipline for the discipline of worrying. Some of us worry so much we can actually call it a discipline. And what we've got to do is we've got to substitute real disciplines that God gives us for the act of worrying, yes? So when you worry, see, worry a lot of times, it's not about what you're saying, it's in your mind. If you're like me, you worry in your mind. You don't even talk about it, but you worry, and, and it wears on you, and it wears on you. 
and you worry and you worry. So if you worry, when you begin to worry, listen to me. Don't go to Netflix. Go pray. <laughs> Don't watch college football, and that's a hard one for me. Pray. Sing a song. Yes. Read the Bible. Or, or, or another thing that you can do. Uh, 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 uh. The Bible says, "Be anxious for nothing." Did y'all did y'all hear me? The scripture says, "Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus." Sometimes all we've got to do is think think about the positive. Yes. So when you're bombarded with the negative, think about the positive. When, when you're bombarded and, and, the, and the enemy comes to you and says, you're not going to make it, you're not going to get out of this, but say, I'm going to make it because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When, when the enemy comes to you and says, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll never get around this one, you say, you know, I, I'm more than, a, I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Yes. Now, now this, is, this, is very, this is very good for somebody because somebody here today is worried about something and the worry is starting to gnaw at you in such a way that it's not even good for your health. I don't know who I'm talking to. But you've got, you got to let that thing go now. It's, time to, it's part of this for me. I, you, you've got to let it go. Worrying, Jesus told his disciples, don't worry. Because worry, if they worry, they could never live into their discipleship. They could never do what God commanded them to do, worrying. They could never go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature worrying. They had to let it go because they could never live into their destiny worrying. Worrying is so powerful that it has the power to derail us of our destiny. Because you're spending, the time that you're spending worrying, you should be doing something positive and constructive, but you're worrying, yes? And the worrying leads to fatigue. And you want to do the positive thing, but you don't have the energy to do the positive thing because the worrying has tired you so, out so much that you don't have anything left. Worrying has the power to derail us of our destiny. So Jesus says, don't worry. Don't do, don't do it. Don't, don't do, don't do it. Don't do it. I care for the sparrow. I care for you. Do not worry. That's, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. I'm almost done because the message for somebody is just don't, don't worry anymore. God's got it covered. He's already, he's already fixed it. My mom, when I, when I worry, sometimes I call home. I, I got the number 717-657. I know, I know that number. I can do it better than speed dial. I can do it. <laughs> mom and dad, yes? And sometimes I worry and I get on my cell phone and I call my mom and dad. And you know, my mom reminds me in her wisdom, she reminds me, she says, Sean, God has a million ways to solve your one problem. God is that great. God is that omnipotent. He's that great. That God, you know, and I'm sitting down thinking about all the ways that I can fix this. And, and normally on a good day, I can only come up with about three. And my mom told me, Sean, God has more than a million ways to fix your one problem. And what God often does is he fixes the problem, but it wasn't on the, it wasn't how I was going to fix it. <laughs> See, because God has all of the variables, yes. God knows the end from the beginning. God is, God's mercy. He's from everlasting to everlasting. God is, God is the one who is, who was, and who is to come. So God's got it all covered. And I want, I, what I want you to do today, when you leave these doors today, I, I want you to leave these doors, but your worry is not going with you. Well, I don't care how serious the problem is. I don't want you to take it with you. And this is the reason I don't want, I don't want you to take it with you. I don't want you to take worry with you because you're a child of God. You're, you're, you're a child. I mean, that, that's a huge revelation that we are God's children, yes? Jesus said, Jesus said, you know, you're, you're a parent. I'm paraphrasing. He says, you're a parent, and you, you know how to give good gifts to your children. Yes? How much more will I give good, good gifts to, to those who ask? You're God's child. And God does not want you to be bogged down with worry and you and you are God's. Now, now, if you didn't get the revelation when I said you are God's child, it may be because we don't understand who God is. Now let me spend a little bit of time on who God is and then I'm going to take my seat. If you're worried today 
I want to tell you that God is bigger than your problem. If you're worried today, God is bigger than your problem, yes? Now, just, we, we have some, some ways to characterize who God is. And very briefly, we know that God, God is in time and God is outside of time, yes? So, so I know that we have 24 hours in a day and we've got this thing all broken down and daylight savings time and all this wonderful stuff that we have. But, but God, God functions on another plane, yes? Have you ever been in a situation and you didn't have enough time? I, I, was, I was there in college. I didn't have enough time to write the paper, but somehow I wrote the paper. Are you, are you following me? The, the measurement on the clock would not give me, would not give me the space that I needed to create what I needed to create. But, but by God's grace, you met the deadline. Yes. God is omnipotent, all powerful, all knowing, eternal. God, God's got it all fixed. Now, what God, what, what God wants you to do when you leave here today is make a commitment to trust God. For your situation. And you say, oh God, I'm going to trust you. It could be a health situation, a child, a family situation, a relationship situation, a, a money situation, whatever it is. I want you to trust God and know that God, God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. That God's already got it covered. Now, when you live, when you live like that, when you live in trust and confidence, what you do is you boost God. If it's possible, you boost God's ego. In other words, in other words, you, you prop God up in such a way that God has to act on your behalf. Why? Because you, because you trust. Because you believe. And so I want you right now, as I say this prayer, as I say this prayer, I want you to believe God that God already has it fixed. The situation is already resolved. Yes, in God's time, it's already resolved. It just has to be manifested in our time, but it's already fixed. God already has it fixed. But God needs you from this day forward, God needs you to trust. No more doubt. No more worry. No more. No, it's, it's, it's done. Now today, we're, we're done worrying about what God has already promised to provide. We're done. No more worry. Yes? And my promise to you is that God will come through. And when God comes through, it may not be in your time. Sometimes we miss God's blessing in our lives because we're, we're thinking, God, you should have already done it. God, you know, I, I expected you to fix this by last Thursday. <laughs> and I'm living in next Thursday, and the situation still has not been resolved. And sometimes we miss God. God has already fixed it, but we, we're just not, we're not, in, we're, we're, we're calculating it on our time. See, God, God is, in, is, the, is the author of time. And God's going to resolve it in God's time, yes? And then, see, the, the old folks used to say back in the day, he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. There's a little story that I'm going to end, that I'm to end with to, to, to demonstrate our point. It's a story that you all know about, and it's about, it's about how God always comes through in God's time. And the story, as it happens to be, is about this, this man named Lazarus. Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Jesus had a, a, a really good relationship with this family. Whenever, whenever Jesus went through Bethany, he would stay at Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' home. He really loved this family. I can't imagine Jesus loving my house so much that whenever he was in town, he'd stop by. <laughs> Jesus is staying with me today. <laughs> and after Jesus came through, he stopped by at this house, and, and they called for Jesus one day. And they gave him a message that, that you've got to come. You've got to come right now because Lazarus is sick unto death. You've got to come right now. And Jesus began to go, but he was delayed in his coming. By the time that Jesus gets to Bethany, the Bible says that, that Lazarus was already dead. That's how it is with us a lot of times. We expect God to come through. And, and, and God is still working something, but we say, God, well, you know, it's too late now. The reality is, is that God just doesn't want to fix the problem that you've been dealing with. God wants to handle three or four of them, but you just got to be patient. Yes? They said word to Jesus. They said, Jesus, and one of the sisters of Lazarus says to Jesus, you know, Jesus, essentially, I'm glad you're here, but it's, it's too late. She says to Jesus, if you had come when we called for you, 
this would not have happened. In other words, if you would have accommodated my time schedule, this would have never happened. Lazarus is dead. In fact, Lazarus has been dead for four days now. The stench of death has already filled the tomb. It's too late. How many of us are living in the reality of too late? It's already, it's just, it's already disrupted now. It's already, the program is corrupt now. There's nothing else that can be done. You're, you're too late. And Jesus says, he says, well, take me to the tomb. Take me to the tomb. I know he's been dead for, for four days, but I am resurrection. I am the life. The one that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So he goes to the tomb and, and he weeps over the loss of Lazarus. And then he says something very interesting, very powerful. He says, Lazarus, come forth. And the one who had been dead for four days, the one who was wrapped in grave clothes, he got up. And Jesus tells the bystanders, he says, loose him and let him go. Well, what does that have to do with me today? Well, some of us, some of us are living in a place where we feel like, you know, uh, there's, there's nothing else, there's nothing else. I mean, everything that bad that can happen has already happened. I mean, there's nothing, I should not expect anything good because everything, that, everything bad has already happened to me. There's really nothing to live for. You know, why should I even try? Why should I even have faith? Why should I even believe? Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Loose him and let him go. Now, what I'm telling you today, I'm going to tell you why the story has, has import for us today. Because all of us have suffered through some one thing or another, yes? All of us are living with hurts and, and pains and aches and, and, and doubts and fears. All of us are there at some point in our lives. But the thing is, we're never too far for Jesus to touch us and make us right. We're never too far. Our hurt can never be too deep for Jesus to fix it, to heal it, yes, to make it right. And if you're here today, we're, we're finished today, but we want, you, we want you, for those of you who do not want to leave with worry, we want you to come to the altar today. If you're here today and you're saying today is the last day I'm going to worry about this thing. We want you in faith to come to the altar. And we're going to pray. Now, when you leave, when you leave, when you face that altar, you, you're faith, do you see that cross? Your problem, your problem was handled on the cross 2,000 years. It's already been handled. It's already been handled. You've got to activate your faith so that God can do what you need God to do. Yes? So I want you to come to the altar now. Those of you who want to kneel, you can kneel. If you can't kneel, just stand. But we want you to come to the altar, and we, whatever it is that, you have, that you've been worrying about, we want you to bring it with you. And we're going to pray, and we believe, we believe that when you leave, that you're going to leave whatever is already on the cross. And that this week for you is going to be a different week. I want, I want, I want this to be a worry-free week. Now, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. When you make a commitment not to worry, you know, the devil hears your commitment too. So somebody's going to go to the grocery store after church, you're minding your business, you're on a little high, you feel real great, and you feel real positive, and you, you're going to see something in the grocery store that's going to remind you of what you were worrying about in aisle number three. <laughs> but, but, but when it comes to you, I, I want you to say that I'm God's child. And I am of more value than many sparrows. God's got it coming. In Jesus' name. Why don't you come to the altar in Jesus' name? Let's